Yep. Yep. So I'm getting rain too, or actually, yeah, we, so I just must, had a little bit of a relief. <laughs> yeah, we must have the same the same weather system that's hitting the two the both of us. Yeah. Did you get tons of wind last week during the what did they call it a bomb cyclone? The bomb cyclone. Um, we well we didn't because where we're located we're live by the way. Hi everybody. Um, anyway, uh, so we didn't because I'm on the east coast of Vancouver Island and I'm actually kind of nestled in the mountains. And so, oh. so far, we haven't been getting any of these big windstorms. Like, windstorms have been coming through and pushing 60 kilometers an hour for the people on the coast and especially on the west coast of Vancouver Island. But, but where I am, kind of nestled on the east side, but up in the mountains, there's been almost no wind all, all the time. I've been quite impressed. Just more rain. Like, we get more rain than, than the cities nearby. But... So it's like, you know, imagine, you know, the Pacific Northwest, but with more rain. With more rain. What's the, yes, that would be underwater. <laughs> it, it feels that way. Yeah, absolutely. I think we got, uh, yeah, we're having days we're getting 60 millimeters a day for day after day after day. Wow. It's, and as we're building, it's been absolutely causing us to have to just deal with water. Like a lot of our time is spent and with our construction people about like, where do we put the water and how do we dig trenches and push water around yeah it's been it's been well, it's probably funny. good to be doing it now and then you don't have to do any remedial work after the place is built you'll know the french drains and, yeah exactly you know, we know what's the stuff. worst that's possible and we know that we can kind of endure it so absolutely but even like the the culvert to our road blew out last year and had to be completely replaced oh, God. so it's been yeah there's a lot of water that flows up here anyway uh we've actually started um the question i always like to ask people who are you what do you do uh, I'm Mary Wojtek. Uh, in a former life, I was a researcher in the area of microbial ecology and biogeochemistry and aquatic systems. Uh, and about 12 or 13 years ago, I started working at NASA as the lead scientist for astrobiology. So I direct our program, um, which mainly encompasses uh, focusing on funding research and workshops um, to enable the agency to search for life beyond Earth. So astrobiology, for people who don't know, is the study of the origin and evolution of life and a habitable planet uh, in order to understand where we can look for life beyond Earth. So and, that's that's my job. And it's interesting, like I think, you know, obviously, it, are we alone in the universe? Is there life out there? Is like possibly one of the most important scientific questions that humanity can ask. And it is obviously a scientific question. And yet, for the longest time, it was a forbidden science. Um, it was definitely not taken uh, very seriously while other fields of planetary science and astronomy and cosmology and all these other fields were moving forward. What do you think started to change the mindset that now it is time to fold the search for life back into into the kind of science that we're doing at NASA? Well, I think um, I think part of it is historically, as you mentioned, uh, you know, where did we come from and are we alone has been around for forever. I like quoting the, the atomists from 500 BC that had a quote about, you know, in a field, uh, if you were to sow seed, it would be odd to imagine only one plant growing. And so they thought way back then that there's no way we were alone in the universe. Uh, I think that it has struggled as a science only because, uh, in part because of, of a misconception. Uh, often we've been accused as a science without a subject uh, and because it, as far as we knew, you know, nobody had discovered life anywhere else. And how can you be study, studying the possibility of life elsewhere if you don't actually already know where you might find it. And so it was a lot of education and managing expectations of the of the public and our fellow scientists about what it would take to prepare ourselves to actually do uh, a good job looking for life. So understanding, you know, what life is in terms of, of any um, phenomena that it is responsible for that we could measure somewhere else on another planet or another location. Um, it, it, it meant understanding the limits to life based on the life that we know here on earth. So we had many years of, you know, I like to point out that at the same time we were sending two landers to Mars, 
the Viking landers to look for life there. We were also sending a submersible down to the bottom of the ocean where we found this incredible oasis associated with uh, hydrothermal vents. And that was life that we never expected. And that was as alien as we could possibly imagine. We, we discovered a whole new way that life could support itself in terms of where it got its energy. Up until that point, all we knew about were, was photosynthesis and the fact that everything on our planet was being driven by the energy from the sun. And plants were feeding everything, including animals and you know the entire food chains. And so um, it has been a, a long time coming and teasing out what we, mainly what we don't know about life, um, putting aside some of the hubris we had early on, thinking we knew what we were doing, um, to spend more time realizing that it's a tough question and that as the more we learn about how life arose on earth, the more we realize that it took advantage of things that were happening that weren't biological. And so teasing it apart from those non-biological processes becomes very difficult. You know, it turns out life depends on amino acids, but you can make amino acids without life. So if you find an amino acid somewhere, it doesn't mean you found life. It means you found some kind of process, a biological or biological that could have produced it. So that's been a real, a real struggle uh, in trying to tease apart what was biological and not biological. And that brings us kind of to, you know, the, the paper that we put out or that got published last week, thinking about standards of evidence, um, trying to think about how to uh, not talk about finding life as a binary function. Oh, we found it or we didn't find it. Oh, bummer. We don't know anything else. But that every time we learn something as we explore our own planet as well as elsewhere, we learn more about distinguishing the difference between life, understanding how our planet works, understanding how our planet will continue to work in the future as we, you know, perturbate various things on our own planet. So, you know, the, 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 idea of searching for life requires real rigor and stringency in the look, as we look. The what reason it's so important right now is that NASA and other space agencies are investing in missions to actually go and look in Mars, you know, perhaps to Enceladus, to Europa. And, and now, you know, I understand that announcements being made about the decadal survey done for the astrophysics and astronomy uh, division at NASA that's suggesting that we should have large space-based telescopes that will look for life around other stars. And so this is now a reality. It's not the, the um, it's not something we talk about over wine or, it, you know, as a theoretical conversation in the classroom as we learn about what life could be. This is really happening now. And and now we need to get super serious about when we find these things, how do we communicate it? How do we know what we're looking at? Um, or do our discoveries make sense? And, and how do we entrust what we're learning or, or, or get the trust of the public as we communicate this so that they're not bored unless we have something you know, ultimate to announce, but they realize that, that all of, all of that, all the things that we're learning first to what makes a planet habitable? Where on Mars would you look for life? All of this is stuff that we want to have a conversation with the public about and, and have them understand the difficulties and the joys of the things that we find. And I think, you know, we're all familiar with the missteps of the past. Um, and it's not necessarily it's a NASA thing. It's I mean, it's a scientist thing. So we, you know, we think about the Viking experiment, we think about the discovery of possibly an arsenic based life form here on Earth, the discovery of the Allen Hills meteorite, phosphine on Venus, um, the wow signal, and so on and so on and so on. And you've got all these, these these events, these things that have been discovered, evidence that has been gathered that in traditional science would be just the way you do business, that this stuff comes up all the time, you know, further analysis will probably make it go away. And yet, because I guess the hunger for some kind of discovery is so big, we're all literally on the seat, you know, edge of our seats all the time, hoping for that announcement, each one goes you know, much bigger, much wider, much more clickbaity headlines than is expected. And so is so under sort of that umbrella, 
t talk a bit about this new paper that you guys released and sort of what is the goal of this new direction that NASA is hoping to go with their science uh, publicizing? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. I think that in any other field, maybe except for a, a good analogy is to think about what's gone on with COVID research. People are hungry to know, what do we know about it? What is the future? What can, how can I protect myself? And so there was a lot of literature that came out, sometimes with opposing ideas about what was the mode of action of the virus? How could we prevent it? What might we do to, to treat it, to, to vaccinate or, or you know, prevent the spread? And all of it was valid, but because of our, our desire to know, um, you know, everybody in the public was on top of, of the story, right? Because it was affecting us per, uh, personally. Um, this question affects us personally about whether or not we are alone. So we're much on top of what's going on as well. And, and the scientific debates that are normal in the scientific process don't get to settle on what we know because it's, it's happening real time with, with the public really paying attention. And so as a result of that, <clears throat> I think that, again, the two things that we hoped to, um, to accomplish, well, there are many things, but we wanted, we wanted um, to ask the scientific community to think about how we as a com science community can take responsibility for the information that we're giving to, um, to the public and to realize that there's such interest in this that even if you've qualified your results to the nth degree, the fact that you mentioned life is going to take you to the front pages. And it's, you know, it, 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 you need to be aware of it and you need to, to realize that the story that you have about your science can get out of control before you even, you, you know, you even have your morning coffee. And so part of it is, again, to get scientists to take a look at it and to be aware that this is what it's going to be like and to think about how we can tell the story of the search for life that isn't binary, as I mentioned, where we can talk about different stages of discoveries that get us closer to understanding what it is we're looking for and how to look for it. Uh, in, my, you know, in my job, I get really excited about proposals for new instruments or proposals of other theoretical frameworks to look at what life is doing to a planet so that we can observe it remotely. Um, that sort of stuff is actually big news. And I like to think that the public is interested in enough that we can actually bring them along in, in that, that it's an adventure and to bring them along and get them just as excited as I can be. I don't think it's just nerds or people that are excited. And so that's part of it. Um, and then also to, you know, um, to, to, in doing so, since a lot of people report on news based on what will stimulate the public's interest, if we can demonstrate that the scientists are engaging with the public, that the public wants to know all about it, then reporters don't have to run to the far end with the discovery either. And so it's just, it's, <laughs> that's, that's what my dog Gizmo thinks about it. <laughs> Sorry. I've got I've I got the rain. Water a squirt. <laughs> uh, I've got the rain and, and you've got the dog. This is perfect. Yeah, this is a classic West Coast conversation. Yeah. <laughs> and we have a cat walking by the house, so that's that's kind of what's going that's on. That's exciting. Here. Anyway. So um yeah, so I was just, you know, I think I have one of the most amazing jobs on the planet. I love the, this whole search of understanding what life is and, and learning more about it all the time and just being amazed by it. And I want to make sure that we figure out the right way to share it with the public and to, to not get people, you know, one of the things that happened after the Viking uh, landers was it was sort of decided that we didn't know what we were doing. And so we should stop searching for a while until we figured things out. And, you know, that, that mission was designed with the, the best available knowledge that we had at the time. Um, it certainly would have worked with some other controls and if we had understood the Martian environment better, but we didn't. And so one of the things that we were taught was we need to know a lot more about uh, the environment in which you make a detection to, to 
up that that uh, confidence. And in fact, that's one of the levels on the scale that we propose is, does your measurement make sense uh, in the environment in which you're making it? Or does that does that environment change your interpretation? Well, let's um, let's and, do that. Let's know, talk I, about the, yeah. the scale, because I think it's, it'd be good to give give that context as well as we as we move forward. So what's the what are the seven levels that that you're proposing with with this new scale? Well, uh, let me just say that we proposed um, a, a, a potential scale, a way to think of it, and and I'm on the actual levels, if that's okay, but just talk about the concepts behind it. So at the very bottom of the scale, you know, the reason we use seven is simply because in, in NASA speak, we have something called the technical readiness uh, level, which has to do with getting technology ready to fly. And so we thought that that was something that would resonate with our, our engineer friends and colleagues. Um, but whether it's seven, five, 10, whatever, it, it, it doesn't really matter. But the idea is to go from identifying what you wanna measure and having a reason for why you're measuring, it represents some particular phenomenon of life. Uh, when you make that measurement, you wanna make sure that you believe the measurement, that it's, that it's reproducible, that it's any time in science, you wanna make sure that you believe your measurement, that it's high enough above background, that your instrument is sensitive enough, that there isn't contaminating factors that might be involved. You know, one of the things that we worry most about when we think about searching for life is something called planetary protection. You know, and um, our former planetary protection officer once said that if you wanna find life on, the surest way to find life on Mars is to take it with you. So we wanna make sure that there aren't contaminating uh, molecules or organisms on our, our vehicles, on our instruments, um, because contamination, I mean, there's a long history in science as well as of contamination um, being what the signal was. There was a very famous set of uh, researchers looking at the human genome and ended up um, encoding part of it that came from a carrier molecule that had come from uh, a fish protein. And so suddenly there's some fish uh, DNA in the human genome. And it turned out, fortunately, they discovered it was a contaminant because it didn't make sense. Um, but you know, at the lowest level, you wanna make sure you believe your measurement, that you've done everything to make sure it's not spurious, it's not a contaminant and it's real. And then you need to start considering things more seriously about, you know, can this be made abiologically? And if it can be made abiologically, what other things could you measure to rule that out. You know, if you, if you think of something that's produced also by a volcano, is there evidence of volcanic activity? If not, you remove that as a possible source. Uh, if there is, then it calls into question, is it the volcano or is it life? Um, you think about the environment in which you, you have found your signal, both in terms of Life is very dynamic and there's some features of life that are diagnostic that are not very resilient in the environment. And I, I'll mention, you know, one of the things that most people know about now is RNA. And it's a very important molecule in, in biology, but if it is not protected within a cell, it can get destroyed very rapidly. So does it make sense to have naked RNA out in the environment, uh, particularly when things like um, solar radiation is, is hitting it? No, it doesn't. It's not going to be preserved. So you maybe don't want to look someplace like that. You want to look in an environment where it's preserved, where it's protected. And so, you know, that moves us up further on the scale. Does it make sense that it's in this environment? Does it make sense if you think about what, um, what a life would be like if it was in this environment based on what we know about Earth. Can you repeat the, the measurement? Are there other measurements that are gonna support it? And you just keep moving up in the fidelity of what you think you've observed. Um, and it's, it's tough, but you know, as, as the quote from Carl Sagan, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. It's honest to do that extraordinary evidence part because this is a huge deal. We're it's interesting, like when, you know, astronomers, when they, or let me see, this is more of like my evolution as a science journalist, but, but, you know, 10 years ago, 
I was looking, you know, we sort of, I would flippantly say if you point a telescope at a, at another planet, you, and if you find large amounts of say oxygen in the atmosphere, it's sort of a smoking gun that you found life on that world. And then, okay, there's actually lots of, of abiotic methods that you can actually get oxygen. So then there's ozone and then there's methane. Methane's exciting. Oh no, it turns out there's ways that you can get methane. And even with this discovery of potentially of phosphine on Venus, there's, there are ways that you could get phosphine. And it, it feels to me like as we move forward, especially as with all of these, these planets being so far away and the, the observations being so difficult, that we're going to live in this inconclusive world for a long time, that we're not going to go big, great big press release, NASA's found life on what whatever Proxima Centauri. It's going to be hints, ideas, possibilities, evidence suggests for decades, maybe as we move through this process. But that's the scientific process. Except as you say, all eyes are on, it matters to us personally. And do you, I have an answer on this, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Like, is the public ready to to follow science the way science should be followed, as opposed to wanting to hear the outcome and then think that's the law. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Like, you know, just to, yeah. that, that it's these incremental changes that, that evidence suggests that ideas are overturned, that it is this evolving uh, sort of counting the evidence towards some conclusion that is the natural way that I'm sure scientists would prefer we all looked at, at that way. And yet people want something that's more black and white. So do you think that sort of the public is ready for that now? Um, I think that's a great question. And I don't know um, that I have the answer. But I think that they're, I think that we assume that they're only going to want the, the, the ultimate answer, and there will be no other interest in it. And I don't, I don't believe that. I think that, um, particularly if the story is, is told correctly, so that they understand what we, I mean, if we're not learning anything, I, I can understand if they fatigue of hearing, oh, we found another planet that could be habitable. At some point, that's not new news. But if there's something about this new planet that suggests more than just it's sitting in a good spot relative to its star, maybe there's a better model that's out there that suggests that, you know, there's um, seasonal water, or they've found another signal that has, you know, something, you know, if we can actually develop a story along the new discovery, and it's not more of the same, I think we can get the public, or at least a significant number of the people in the public. There will always be people, people that are only interested in the headlines that are, that are most it's exciting. But I think, I, I personally think we underestimate, um, the the public you know the public isn't monolithic necessarily but I think we underestimate their interest in science and their in and their willingness to to learn something I'm I mean I think I think NASA is so popular because we're we're we have new discoveries and they're they're things that might not affect their you know I mean finding a black hole how important is that to somebody's personal life not so important I mean and and yet I think people like to hear about that or discovery of a new nebula or something new from the Hubble um, telescope. It's, um, I think people are fundamentally um, interested in new things. And I think that if we do our jobs right, you included, but me starting with me for sure, um, and my agency, I think we can get them interested in it. So what, what is your thought? Tell me what your thoughts are on this. Yeah, so, so I think, you know, you, you said the word story, and I think that's, like, in the beginning, when people show up to, say, my channel or come to read Universe Today, they're looking for the big zingers. They're looking for black hole, first picture of a black hole, and are there wormholes, and when are we going to get a warp drive? And, you know, they want the stuff that science, like, science fiction is like this is like this drift net that's dragging in all of these people into STEM. 
and they show up with a head full of ideas about science fiction concepts and you have to sort of patiently t explain to them why artificial gravity teleportation um etc 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 these are purely science fiction ideas you know essentially to allow captain kirk to be able to show up on a planet and then move to a different planet in a different episode but then the real story of this stuff is every bit as fascinating as a science fiction story and and I analogize it to to like um, to like watching a sports game, like like you know you've watched people watch many games of soccer or football or whatever, and and yet they'll come in each time because there are stories. And the more you know, the more you learn about each individual player, each individual team, the way they interact, the history that everything, the more fascinated it becomes. And, and so I think my job is to quickly get people to that level of detail and granularity where we're talking about individual telescopes, missions, people, discoveries that were made, evidence on this side evidence on that side and try to tell those stories that makes it just as fascinating and then they don't need they don't need to get right to the end to the conclusion and go did we find life or not right like we'll get there for for now for the next few decades we're going to follow each incremental discovery with great interest and really enjoy that that journey and that's the approach that i take as a as a communicator well, one of the things that somebody told me once, and I really like this, is um, they were people when the U.S. Uh, kind of ramped back on their uh, human spaceflight program. You know, there was a lot of people, particularly uh, even in my agency, they were like, oh, space exploration is over because we're not doing as much of this. And and we won't have any public support if we don't have astronauts. And and uh, one of the things that came out was a study that said, actually, while people appreciate the personal achievements of astronauts and what they do on our behalf, people love rovers because they feel like they, you know, like I don't own a person, but I can feel like I own curiosity or perseverance and I can feel much more um, connection to its journey because, you know, and maybe it's because the agency spends more time talking about what it's doing. Um, but they found that people were really interested in it. And I think that that to me was a signal that it doesn't have to be the big flashy stuff. It doesn't always have to be made so personal. They just want to feel part of the adventure. And again, I think that is our job is to, to help the, the public feel like they're part of it. So what, you know, there are a bunch of missions that are coming up now. Um, as you mentioned, the decade, I haven't even read the decadal survey yet. It just came out today. So I'm, I'm looking forward to taking my teeth into it. Although I, you know, I've been reporting up to the decadal survey. So, um, but like, what are the kinds of missions that you are most excited about now for helping to push this question forward of, of, are, are we alone in the universe? Um, well, I mean, there's a bunch of them that are ongoing are just about to be planned and some that have been recommended. So. Um, I'll talk, you know, I was um, the deputy program scientist for a while of the Mars Science Laboratory, so Curiosity Rover, and we were very excited about doing, uh, sending a mission that would do a, a localized analysis of potential habitable environments. You know, we had found evidence remotely that there were uh, large features suggesting there was standing water for quite a, a, a large amount of time on the surface of Mars. And now we wanted to, to dig in and really see if there were um, smaller niches and environments that could support life. And I feel really good about all of those the, and the continued findings from, the, from MSL. Um, that have to do with, yeah, this is a good place. You know, it was a, I had a friend that once said that MSL was like a real estate assessment. You know, you're going to see if the schools are good, if there's a, you know, shopping available and dry cleaning and all the things that you need. And, and that's what it's been doing. And it's great. Um, now we have Perseverance that's looking at a place that potentially could have been an ancient habitat and it will bring back um, or there was, there's a, it is caching samples that will be brought back that will be able to use the full suite of instruments that we have available to us to look for signs of ancient life. And, you know, one thing that people don't always appreciate is unlike in science fiction, where you're, you're moving these entire laboratories and huge instruments around space, we have a real problem with, you know, uh, sustainable instrumentation in terms of this, their size, their 
their mass and their energy requirements. And so we're somewhat limited in what you can operate with um, in space. And so we're really excited about bringing these samples back to be able to analyze them better. And then going beyond Mars, you know, we now have two uh, missions in the works at NASA um, that are going to look at the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. And so we've got uh, uh, one going to Europa and the strategy uh, at NASA is to go and learn more about the environment and not front load a life detection mission. So Clipper is gonna go to Europa and it's gonna try to, uh, it will map the surface it will make measurements that will help us understand more about the processes we've seen from afar in terms of uh, any kind of interaction between the, the subsurface and the surface that it ends up being sort of those brown stripy features on, on the surface. Um, you know, what are those? Are there salts? Are there organics? You know, what, what's going on there? And so I'm really excited about that. That will, um, you know, before you go and look, you need to find out where are the best habitats. So I'm very excited about understanding the, the potential uh, of a habitable environment below the surface at, at Europa. Uh, and then we're sending a mission, uh, Dragonfly, to Titan. And so Titan is amazing because it's the only other body in the solar system that has a liquid on the surface. It's liquid methane and ethane, but nonetheless, it's a liquid. And one thing that we understand about life is, uh, and the reactions important to life, is they need that kind of media. On Earth, it's water and all of the biology that's associated, uh, sorry, all the chemistry associated with Earth's life is done in the presence of water, but what kind of chemistry would you have? And could it be similar to what we've seen on early Earth uh, in an environment that has uh, organics? And so Dragonfly is going to um, actually look at prebiotic chemistry uh, on Titan. And so that's really exciting to me. And then there are others that are talking about going to Enceladus and sampling the plumes. I see some plumes behind you. Uh, <laughs> uh, whether it's flying through that, because we believe that the plumes that we see both coming from Enceladus and likely from Europa at all could be a ex surface expression of the subsurface ocean. So we could learn about what's going on uh, in the interior. And so those missions are, are extremely exciting to me. Uh, and that those are probably the most exciting things. Um, uh, although I'm also pretty excited about OSIRIS-REx and it bringing back materials from, uh, from uh, Bennu. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that we discovered and one of the reasons we went from calling it exobiology to astrobiology is understanding, you have to understand how the solar system is formed and how your planet within it was formed in order to understand habitability and why it turns out we've got a verdant planet like Earth and yet our two closest um, sister planets, Mars and Venus, don't have life. And so what's different? Is it something that was from how it first uh, was created? And so we'll learn our solar system from samples coming back from, from Bennu. So that's really exciting as well. And then, and then we have going beyond the solar system and the missions that concepts that have been studied during the last few years Notably, I'm most familiar with HabX and Louvoir, which are the very large space telescopes that will follow on to, uh, I didn't mention TESS, which was able to detect other exoplanets and JWST that will also be able to detect exoplanets and could even tell us something about the atmospheres of those, um, of those exoplanets. Actually, um, having a mission that is directly designed to look at a planet's atmosphere and look for signs of biological processes. I mean, in all cases, you know, when you look from afar, it's easiest when biology is a major part of what's going on on the planet. On Earth, it's clear biology is a planetary process. It created the first pollutant, it created oxygen. And, and that's one of the reasons people have been so interested in potentially looking for oxygen. But a big signal like that is certainly much easier to see than, you know, finding an organism in a cave somewhere that requires, you know, is a lot more technologically difficult. It doesn't mean it's not there and that we shouldn't look at some point, but it's harder to do. So, um, but we have to, you know, well, I guess I've said 
I'm sure I've left out something else. I mean, I, I, well, I, I just about astrobiology is a field that all discoveries are important to. Yeah. Well, and, and I think, you, you know, one of the ones that that hasn't really played a role yet is human space exploration. But as humans return to the mu moon and if humans are able to set up a human research base on Mars, then you bring that human element to the astrobiology challenge. What what role do you think humans will play in searching for life for starters on Mars? So humans in space, because, of course, humans play an important role. Yeah. Yeah. In From, already. Yeah. Um, I think that, um, you know, one of the the having I think about so I'm a, a field biologist or a field scientist. And while you can do a lot of things remotely, being actually at the site um, is really important. So I think having humans closer to what you're studying is, is going to be a bonus. We won't have to wait as long to get samples back. Uh, it will be easier to, t to send follow-up missions. You know, when uh, I was trained originally as an oceanographer and did actually my research in Antarctica, and I could make multiple trips. Um, and so I didn't have to like front end everything and hope I could measure. I was lucky enough. Sometimes it's just luck that you will have figured out the right measurements, the right instruments, the right samples to have collected. You will actually be able to return much more easily. Uh, and of course, there's a, there's a concern that once you get humans in the loop in an environment where there clearly isn't a whole lot of biology, otherwise we would have found it already, you um, you risk contamination. And so that's something that's gonna be really important for us to, to consider. And there've been all sorts of conversations about how we might handle that, um, you know, to somehow preserve, much like on earth, we have critical areas and preserves where they're maintained as pristine as possible or as protected as possible so that we can study it without you know, introducing ourselves into the study. And we might choose to do something like that on Mars as well. So every every advance also has a, a downside that you have to consider as you move forward. Um, yeah, I, it, it'll be, you know, people always ask me about colonizing Mars. I'm, I'm not a huge fan of the idea of colonizing Mars, but I would absolutely love to see a permanent research station on the moon on Mars, like we have in Antarctica, where you've got astronauts coming and going boots on the ground and, and being able to actively research this stuff. And as new techniques and ideas are developed, there's sort of nothing more capable and adaptable than a human being for, for the foreseeable future to be able to do this work, it would be a you know, you get 1000s of times more samples done than a, than a rover. Um, but they're soft and made of, you know, flesh and lots of cells. And, <laughs> lots yeah, of lots cells. Of organic. Yeah, lots of organic. They bring a lot of debris with them and, and so on. So it's definitely very tricky to keep them alive in such a hostile environment. So we've got a bunch of questions that came in from the from the audience. And I would love to uh, Can I to... say one thing to that before you get to the sure. questions? And I'll say, this is another one of those places where it's our story to tell. And so I don't want people to think that nothing gets done because there aren't humans in the loop directly, because a lot of advances actually in science and medicine in particular have removed the person. There are things like, I think that there's uh, remote operations that are done now, and they can be done much more precisely by instruments than they can by a surgeon with a scalpel. And so again, not having a human in the loop isn't always bad or isn't always, um, uh, you know, a, 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 a uh, second place uh, in what you would desire that, you know, robotics is going to be important, even if there are humans there, and we're still able to do quite a bit um, before we, we attempt that huge challenge of getting a, a base on Mars. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, so here we go. A couple of questions here. Um, uh, all right, so T Home asks, in your opinion, if we did find life, what's the most likely form that it would take? Well, right now we're we're betting on it being something like our own. Um, you know, in terms of the the fundamental things we understand about life on Earth, you know, it's going to be carbon based. It's going to use energy from the from a few of the sources that we're aware of that can fuel life. Um, I think in terms of where it is, you know, if you 
I, I, I'm not sure if that was the question or if the question also was, is I think that the life is likely to be microbial and it's not just because I'm a microbiologist. Um, I think that if you think about the evolution of life on our planet, we had microbial life here for probably as much as 4 billion years, um, three and a half billion for sure, maybe even as much as 4 billion. And we only had things that we recognize a little bit more obviously without the aid of a microscope as life in the last, you know, 500,000. And, you know, if you're going to hope for a human, that's even more recent. And so I like to hedge the, my bet for the search. And so I think what we're going to find first is evidence of microbial life. People always ask this question, like, like, and it's weird because it's as if it's like, the, like they've discovered this great idea, which is like, why is NASA searching for life as we know it? Why don't they search for life as we don't know it? I'm sure you get this question all the time. How do you respond to that? Well, I respond, it's pretty difficult to, you know, when you send a mission something somewhere, you're really stuck with what you're going to measure. And what you're going to measure is predicated on what you understand about the environment that you're going to and what you think you're looking for. And so it becomes very difficult um, to think about um, what else could we be looking for. I will say that one of the things that we've tried to do in the last five or 10 years is do something called looking at agnostic biosignatures. And so there are some things that we think probably are universally true about, about life. Uh, no matter what form it takes. And one of it is it's going to need energy. You know, one of the ways, or, or at least a life that we could recognize. Most things that are biological in origin uh, have evidence of having additional energy put into it, however it was harnessed. And so we can be more open to what those energy sources are and what a change in the flux of energy or looking at energy dissipation or whatever it is, we can be more agnostic about what caused it. Maybe we don't need to know the exact reaction or the exact form of life. Um, we can also, the more we understand about the environments that we're looking at, the more we can look for what one colleague called a disturbance in the force. So if you have a prediction of what something's going to look like, everything we know about this planet, the atmosphere should look this way, and they should have relative, con um, you know, con concentrations of various compounds, but there's this really strange chemical that's there. And we can't think of any way that could have been made abiologically. Is that evidence of bio, you know, some, some life form um, creating that? And so we have to be very open and there are ways that we can do that, but targeting at a mission for looking as life as we don't know it is gonna be extremely hard. Um, but it, But again, as I said, much of what we think is necessary to even understand the biosignatures that we know and that are linked very tightly to biology require taking measurements that may prove, uh, you know, might provide evidence of something else we could be observing. But I I'll tell you, being given the responsibility of looking and thinking that, you know, we could go to Europa and it could be standing there right in front of us and we wouldn't recognize it because we didn't know what to look for is, is doesn't keep me up at night, but does have me worried. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and part of it, I think, is like every place that we find life here on Earth, it, it's because we found water, like just whether it's deep below the ground, whether it's high up in the atmosphere, whether it's snuggled around a, the radiation uh, core of a, of a, you know, a nuclear uh, power plant, whether it is in freezing cold, boiling hot, if there's water, there's life. And so it makes sense just from a low hanging fruit standpoint, like just like, can we find places with water? Because on Earth, you literally cannot find a place with water without life. And mm -hmm. so now can you go to places on Europa and Enceladus and Mars, which have evidence for water and not find life? Like it's just, it's just the first like, like be patient, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's the low hanging fruit. I think if fruit. you talk to most of us in astrobiology, we're not dreamers. We just find it hard to imagine that there is something so special about Earth and the conditions that set this up that it wouldn't be somewhere else. And it wouldn't have been for some period of time. I mean, there's still unanswered questions. How long does it take to get life to take hold? And and was was Mars or Venus at one point habitable enough, long enough 
to actually um, have life? Are there places now on either of those planets that could still sustain life, uh, even if it was barely holding on? Um, I, I think we like to think we're open to those possibilities, um, but I have to say, I, I um, it's not, it's kind of like when people talk to me about why are you only looking at planets in the habitable zone? Enceladus isn't in our habitable zone. And yes, we think there might be life there. It's, I think, you know, again, it's a search and we have limited resources. And so we're trying to make a lot of preemptive decisions that may hurt us in the end. It may not be where we ultimately find it, but, but we're trying to increase the probability that we will find evidence of life. So as you said, looking someplace where there's evidence of water there now is really great, or even in the past is where we're going to go. You know, we haven't talked about, say, going to look for life in the sun. There might be life there, but we're not going there for that. Um, so, um, you know, and again, I think one of the things that's really important and people should know is that astrobiologists almost never say never. Uh, because we're always proven wrong, and um, and you know we always learn that that possibilities far exceed my imagination. Absolutely. Okay. So here's another one. Arjun asks, do you think any life-based encoding would look like DNA, RNA, or could anything else be a good encoder? That's actually a really great question. And I fund uh, some research to look into what other sorts of things could encode information. I think that that's, again, one of those universal principles that we think that for life to sustain itself, it has to have ways to record information and pass it on. And so I think that there are other sorts of information molecules that people are looking into. Um, you know, right now it turns out that at least as we understand it, DNA is really great and RNA are very part, a part of a really uh, highly evolved, very efficient system. Um, but there are other, you know, we, we digitize information all the time. We have chips. We have even, even more crude than that, you know, you can record some information on just crystals and you can reproduce them. Um, the tricky part with that then becomes one of the things that's critical to life on earth is its ability to evolve and adapt. And it turns out that you can't do that with crystals. You know, if there's any imperfection in the crystal, it doesn't work as it's supposed to work. It doesn't get to form a new function because it's going to do better in a different environment. And so not only do you need to be able to store that information, but you need some system that allows that information, some ability uh, or um, plasticity to evolve towards something that will make an organism more likely to be able to take advantage of a new environment, a new niche, or to do better as its own world is changing. So um, I do think there are other molecules uh, and we're, we're looking for ones that then have the next level of, of importance. That is that, that plasticity and flexibility. Okay, so uh, Dustin King asks, we've already found life on one planet Earth. How many places would we have to find it before it stops being an extraordinary claim? Wow. <laughs> I love his enthusiasm and optimism. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to ask you the reverse in a second, but, but please answer the question. Well, yeah, I was going to say that, so one of the areas I work in is life in extreme environments. And I'm still amazed every time we find a new, you know, a, a new group of organisms in an environment that I would have thought was too harsh to support life. So I don't even know what that number is. It would take a while for us to be unexcited about it, I think. In fact, I can't even imagine us being tired of it. So, so you, you find evidence that there was life on Mars. You've every vent that gets explored on Europa or Enceladus has got active life today. In fact, all the icy worlds seem to have life, et cetera, et cetera. So let's go the other direction then. Um, we've, we've explored the solar system thoroughly, no events of life either now or in the past. We've built powerful life finding telescopes like Habex and Louvoir and in a ever expanding sphere, we detect no evidence of, of any kind of astrobiology, all the techno signature searches 
come up dry. What, how do we put that into context as human beings and life forms living on this planet? What, what takeaway should we take from that? Well, first of all, I'm sorry, I'm going to push back on your assumption that we could have looked everywhere possible. I just, that's not going to happen in any one of our you know, well, multiple lifetimes. But that's, it's now. just a thought experiment. It's just in my mind and in my mind, we did it. Yeah. 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 But I understand. Um, yeah. It's going to be tough to, yeah. to rule out a negative. Yeah. And I, and I actually, I also think that because it's also something I think we fundamentally want, it's hard to imagine us ever giving up on that search as well. Um. And so I, I, that's something that I can't even imagine that, that it isn't somewhere. I, I do think, and part of the problem is, is as you well know, you know, we're observing stars and potential planets around those stars then that are already dead. And so maybe life was there and we'll never get a chance to detect it because it's long gone. Um, you know, I talk to people about, about why we don't all only look for techno signatures uh, and that is that, you know, I think some people would argue that techno signatures are a slam dunk in terms of if you hear somebody say hello from somewhere else, it's, you know, it's hard to explain it any other way. On the other hand, if you think about our, the evolution of our own planet, there's only about 50 to 100 years where we were making enough noise for anyone to hear us much less actively sending out some kind of signal. And what is the likelihood in the vast universe that we're gonna hit the exact time that somebody's making noise and we actually are able to hear it. And so I think that you would always be left with, we missed it. Not that it's not there, not that it was ever not there, but that we just haven't been able to find it. And at this moment in time, there doesn't seem to be anybody else or anything else out there. But but even if we missed it, that means that it's rare, that it's a lot more special, that I think the Earth is is a very special place that's really worthy of our protection. Well, then I'll ask you, what makes it special? How many do you have to, how few do you have to have before you've decided it's rare and special? Well, I, I that's sort of my working assumption right now. I'm just going to assume that it's rare and special because I think the planet Earth needs protecting and... But I, but, and I think that the light, that the universe is made better with life, that life is an improvement to rocks and, and water and other raw ingredients, just sort of bumping around thanks to gravity endlessly. And, and so I think that, that if we do these searches and it just year after year after year, and the, I talked to someone on the Louvoir team and they said that if they, when Louvoir is operational, it may be one of the larger, like say a 15 meter or a 20 meter version of it, that you will be able to scan a sphere around the earth with such precision that you could rule out to about 95% accuracy that if there is life in the Milky Way, because just because you've ex explored this, ex this gigantic sphere around us. And that's a and and although obviously there could be life hiding in some nook and cranny, but when we think about a bustling world filled with a variety of life forms, it feels like that might be something that's very rare and, and special. And I think everyone's baseline assumption to me is it's everywhere. Like it's just, we're just a drop in the bucket. There's tons and tons of life out there. And, and it, almost feels to me like people don't take our own planet so seriously because they feel like they've got other shots at this that we can find another world and another world and another world and don't worry about earth but i think earth is really important i think earth is you know for me it's the best planet in the entire universe <laughs> but it's possible that i evolved really the best into, one i've ever been it's, on. <laughs> it's possible i evolved into this environment who can say um but but that's yeah, yeah and i i have this this worry that whenever I talk to people, they're not concerned enough that we are alone and that our planet is that the, then they because the, the next conclusion is, boy, I'd better really take care of the planet that I live on and make sure that it lasts as long and is, and is as healthy and is well taken care of as, as possible. And that's that's just sort of a, a, a mild concern that I have when I talk to people about it. Yeah, and, I, and I, I appreciate that you're concerned about stewardship and conservation. And we certainly, you know, during various times of exploration, we thought about, 
we have as humans gone places, exhausted the resources there and then moved to the next. And um, I think the one thing that, 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 that we can be assured of is we are unique in our solar system, just in terms, I mean, you know, even if we end up st establishing bases on, and now this is non, not my non-official, but my personal opinion about this, if we establish someplace on Mars, you still can't open up the door and go out and breathe the air, which, you know, that would be a problem for me. I, I really like it outside. <laughs> um, and so I think that, and if there are places just like Earth in another galaxy, we're not getting there anytime soon. And it's really silly to think about, you know, trashing your place because some generation down the line from you, which might not even last if you trash Earth, is going to get there. So I, I don't think that those seems like like somewhat separate argument or you know discussions to me. And I would hope that people don't. Um, you know, uh, think about grass being greener or a better, uh, you know, another planet somewhere else and not think about we have an, ob you know, we, we are in control of this planet in many regards and what we do matters uh, towards its future. And so I'm, and I'm with you. I'm a conservationist and environmentalist. Weirdly, I mean, that is a like when people hear about Elon Musk's plans for settling Mars and so on and so forth, there's this feeling in the, in the in the public that these billionaires want to escape Earth so that they can have a better life on Mars. But obviously, that's absolutely not true. For as you say, you can't open the windows, Mars, you know, your life on Mars is just going to be a desperate struggle for survival all the time. And you know, take Antarctica and multiply it by a 1000. And that's how hard it's going to be to live on on Mars. And but I think that that is the you know, that is that is sort of like some kind of philosophical out offshoot of people having this, they think that their people want to go to greener pastures, they are better places. And and that's just the, the concern that I have, we'll get a couple of minutes left. Um, I guess, you know, people who are fans of astrobiology, um, what should they be keeping their eye on? What is the next big event that everyone should should be watching? That's going to be coming up? Uh, well, mo the, the closest, the two closest things I think are, uh, well, first of all, always follow what we're, we're doing on Mars and with our rovers. The Europeans are going to launch their own rover, the Rosalind Franklin rover. Um, so I should be, I would be looking for that. JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be launched and there we, after its first light, I think there's going to be some exciting things that, that we see with that. That's a great thing. OSIRIS-REx samples will be coming back. Um, those are the ones that are going to tell us something about how our solar system was formed. Um, you know, it's hard. There, there's almost, I mean, it's almost exhausting being at NASA these days. We have so many things that are going on. We just lost, launched Lucy, which is going to check out the Trojan asteroids. Um, which again are, uh, will tell us something about how think, the sort of the, the leftover bits and pieces after our planets formed. Um, yeah, there's just, we have the DART mission. It, they're just hardly, I mean, we have a very busy schedule and we're not the only space agency. So check yeah. out what JAX is up to and ESA and ISRO. Um, the Middle East is getting into it. I mean, there's, there's lots of stuff going on. Yeah, there really is. It's people always people always tell me like they're they're so sad because they're gonna have to wait so long for say dragonfly but then i can just rattle off 10 fascinating missions that are launching this year that will keep you entertained and busy and help you while away the time before the for some of these flagship missions that you're excited about well mary it was an absolute pleasure to have you here chatting with me today um good luck with what i think is a <laughs> monumental challenge of both finding life in the universe and also uh accurately communicating uh the the process and the search to the public both are you know they're they're almost exactly the same level in my mind. So you've got your work yeah. cut out for you twice. We do, we do. And I just want to say that, you know, no matter what we scientists do, we're all passionate about this, this quest. And um, I don't think there's a single person that doesn't love telling people that this is what we're involved in. So if you see somebody, I mean, and also um, they're always willing to talk about it. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you <laughs> Thank always you ask. Thank you so much for inviting me, Fraser. No problem. That was really yeah. fun. All right, take care. Thanks a lot.
Good luck. I'll try. Bye. Yeah, I'll try. <laughs>